very good morning and you're welcome to today's signpost webinar i hope you're keeping safe and well wherever you're joining us from today my name is mark gibson and i'm the manager of the chagas connected program and i'm also joined by pat murphy who is the head of the chagas knowledge transfer environment program good morning pat good morning how are, how are you this morning I'm very good, very good. Uh, just to remind everyone that this series is brought to you by Chagas in collaboration with Dairy Sustainability Ireland, the National Rural Network and Food Drink Ireland Skillnet. And today we'll be hearing a farmer's perspective on environmental sustainability, uh, particularly on biodiversity, emissions and water quality. And I'm delighted to be joined by Thomas Duffy, who is a dairy, dairy farmer and former president of Macron Pharma. Thomas, good morning to you. Good morning, Mark. Thanks very much for having me. You're joining us from Cavan this morning. What's the weather like up there today? Uh, a little bit overcast, but probably no harm after the, the last few warm days we've had. Um, yeah, no, it's very nice here. And I have to say it's been a nice change the last two weeks. Yes, indeed. And I think we're promised a good weekend as well. Yeah. So it's um, certainly welcome over in the West here. Get a bit, bit more of the silage in. Um, so, Thomas, could you tell us a little bit about... Um, maybe about the work you're doing and uh, your, your previous life. You were obviously very outspoken president of, of Macro La Firma and uh, you have uh, some environmental credentials as well to, to, to back up what you're saying. Yeah, uh, I suppose I was, I was delighted to hand over to my successor, John Keane. Um, I know he's doing a wonderful job there as Macro president, so I would have served in, in the role for two years. Uh, I had to take a little bit of a step away from the farm. I'm kind of coming back now and trying to trying to play catch up after two years. Uh, but it was very ably managed by my, uh, because we're in partnership here between my uh, parents, um, Ned and Kathleen. Um, and then in terms of, I suppose, my my environmental credentials. So I, I would have uh, gone through Dundalk IT. Uh, I, have a, or I have a bachelor's in sustainable agriculture from Dundalk. And uh, then I kind of still had the appetite to learn more about the environmental side of things, particularly. So I went and I did a master's um, in UCD in environmental resource management, which was really, really valuable um, because it kind of it, it, it covered a, a very wide area from that exactly climate change, uh, conservation management um, and uh, nutrients and, and water quality. And my specific dissertation kind of mini dissertation that I would have done for that master's was um, on cattle breeding for adaptions to climate change uh, before it kind of became a central uh, issue. And so it was very interesting to see the areas where there's huge benefits for farmers uh, in addressing climate challenges and reducing greenhouse gas emissions and how we can work together to do that. It sounds like there's a, a paper or a session in that in itself. We might have you back again. Uh, Thomas, uh, there's a lot of negative, um, I suppose, uh, discussion around farming in the media at the moment um, and uh, some would say it's unfair um, but from your own perspective what what do you make of the 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 narrative that's uh, circulating at the moment yeah it can be very challenging and I kind of I saw it myself during my 10 years uh, or my tenure um, like the loudest most ardent voices will always get the most attention um particularly from it's it's much harder to get attention for a message of people working together even though we see the likes of the burn life project as an example or the asset program uh you know people aren't as interested in talking about things when they're working well um and i think there is still a, a very huge group of people both farmer uh, both agricultural and environmental who are working together on a day-to-day -day basis but the reality is they don't have the time to talk as much because they're too busy doing the work and trying to actually progress the, the industry. Um, and I think it can be challenging. Look, there are genuine, and I'll, I'll touch on it a little bit in a second, but there are genuine challenges to us in, in the agricultural sector. We have trends that we can't ignore and um, that we need to address. Uh, and while we might be doing the right thing, the question is how to scale these things up. Um, and like in other industries, I think it'd be much simpler because you're talking about a small, take, take energy, for instance, you have a small number of energy producers. Switching to renewable energies is, is relatively, it's not easy, but it, it's relatively easy in terms of getting buy-in. But when you have 144,000 plus individual farms, to try and get change on a big scale is a very difficult challenge. And that's where knowledge transfer and the likes of this program are so vitally important. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, look, I'm conscious we're eating into your presentation time here, so maybe we'll get straight to the presentation. Yeah. And a reminder to everybody that you can submit questions for Thomas 
using the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we encourage as many questions as possible. We can't guarantee we'll get through all of them. And today's session is being recorded uh, and it will be available afterwards on the Chagas website, uh, the presentation and the recording. So are, are you okay to share there, Thomas? Sure. Um, yeah. um, and just to, to bring to your attention as well that uh, today's session is being recorded as a podcast and is available on uh, the uh, podcast platform of your choice. Okay, Thomas, we'll hand over to you. And, Perfect. Uh, we'll talk to you afterwards. Thanks very much, Mark. Okay, uh, so I suppose briefly, uh, we're going to be taking a look kind of from my own farming experience and some of the other things that I would have seen on many other farms and kind of discussions I've had with farmers uh, over the last two years and indeed before that. Um, so the question on uh, biodiversity emissions and water quality, and I won't be holding anything back. I will be showing you on the on the farm what has worked or what I feel has worked and what I've seen hasn't worked. Not necessarily because that's not going to encourage me to abandon a project, but it means that there's a different challenge. So I suppose very briefly, and I'm not going to, to dwell on it too much. Uh, we've done the introductions. I'm farming in East Cabin here in a, in a farm partnership with my father, Ned, and, and my mother, Kathleen. Uh, the farm is about 51 uh, hectares in total uh, owned, uh, but it's fragmented. We're extremely fragmented farm split by the N3 here uh, with the uh, large, or the longer out blocks being 10 minutes away. Um, and the grazing platform is the largest block with about 50 acres owned and then uh, about uh, 20, uh, so about uh, six hectares, so about 15 acres rented in um, to try and, and graze 105 cows. And for anyone who's uh, doing the figures, that's quite a high stocking density. Um, there was a time where our stocking density was even higher than this. Uh, and some people talk about stocking densities. Um, well, at one stage, we would have been milking 120 cows on um, 20 hectares. Uh, so we would have had a stocking density greater than five with no potential for bringing in our silage grain because our silage grain was aside. Uh, that was overstocked. There's no two ways about it. Um, it wasn't a profitable way to do the business. Uh, it was a short term measure as we, we try to regain uh, some more grazing land. Uh, at the moment, it is still very challenging. It's quite a high stocking density. Um, and really, that kind of showed me both the vulnerability uh, during that time period when we would get more than three weeks without drought. We'd be in serious trouble here because we were going around so fast. Um, but equally, uh, I think some of the things that I'll talk about later on really showed the benefit. We've been we've been very intensively invested in clover for a long time. And during those dry periods, the clover was what saved us really in the high stocking density because it would regrow so quickly in, in warm weather. Um, so as I say, the cows are, are predominantly hosting Frisian registered uh, with uh, an increasing percentage of crossbreds. And these would be Norwegian, Jersey, uh, and even some older Montpellier based crossbreds uh, bred to high EBI Frisians. And, and we select on that. I'll get into that in a second. Uh, so our, our philosophy is very simple. I heard this great, wonderful phrase one day, willful waste brings woeful want. Um, and that really is what we kind of try to live by. Uh, you know, the first key is, uh, you know, instead of trying to produce more milk, are we wasting milk because somatic cell counts or animals are unhealthy, right? Well, we focus on the health and we eliminate. I, 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 don't, I don't want 10 more buckets of milk if I'm going to, if it's going to lead to one more bucket of waste that just, you know, um, so we try to focus on that. And, and in, I suppose as a result of that, our view on the likes of pollution is it's an expensive business to be in. And we often talk about economic viability. Well, every kg that you're losing to the war or every kg of methane that's produced, right? That's that's essentially, a, you know, a kg of nitrogen that you've purchased it somewhere um, or it's a kg of feed that the animal has converted inefficiently into methane. Uh, and that's that, that's my outlook on it climate change and, and those other elements are also very, very important, but I'm not going to waste something if I can. So as I say, I'm not going to, I'm not going to dwell on the farm here, uh, but it just gives a quick overview of kind of where we are. We're solidly, I would say, middle ground kind of average farm in terms of production. We do some things very well. We don't do things uh, and we need to improve them in other places. The calving interval certainly uh, is an area that we are improving all the time. And we've come down substantially um, from about 295 or so uh, in recent years while using sex semen. Our six week calving rate, um, we're quite kind of happy with about 76%. I'm not, I'm not looking to go much higher than that, uh, maybe 80% or there, thereabouts. Uh, as you can see, kind of uh, first lactation performances there, we're fairly happy with those. Uh, and we're, we're growing in and around 13 tonnes. So some of those fields that you can see are quite low would have been receded. Um, actually, one of them was receded in the multi-species, and we'll get to that now. But in and around, we're probably aiming to produce around 13 tonnes of grass. Um, 
and then supplementing mostly with high quality forages uh, and, and meal to fill the gap, we would be feeding less than, um, our aim really is less than a ton of meal uh, and trying to utilize as much grass as possible. Uh, so those are just kind of some of the overviews. So I suppose the, the, the three elements that, that we've talked about or we'll be talking about, first the emissions. Uh, and I think if there's any message I can get anyone to come away with here is that there's a lot of confusion out there at the moment about greenhouse gas emissions versus ammonia emissions and low emission slurry spreading and protected urea have a benefit in terms of their uh, greenhouse gas emissions, but really their ammonia. Uh, and I, the way I, I would always summarize it is climate uh, change gases, greenhouse gases are global um, gases. Ammonia is a local gas. And when farmers say to me about, you know, the, the cost of investing in, in either using protected urea or using the uh, using low emission slurry spreading, what my response very often with that is, well, actually ammonia at a low level, and you can smell it yourself when you're walking through a very heavily uh, slurry field, um, it, it actually is damaging the cells of the, of the plant around it. Um, and that's why I think low emission slurry spreading is such, a, is such an easy move for 90% of farmers in reality. And then water quality. Uh, so I suppose there we have the question of, you know, surface water and groundwater and surface water is probably more important from a biological point of view. And it's more important from a, a recreational point of view, particularly in the likes of Cavan here, we've got a very good fishing uh, um, tourism, uh, whereas groundwater is really the water that we drink. So that's why we want to protect it. And we have got, you know, Ireland is has historically been very good in terms of nitrates levels. When the nitrates derogation was brought in, I mean, you were to, it was really for uh, more industrialized countries um, because they were suffering, unfortunately, with a thing called blue baby syndrome, which was high nitrates levels and their children was killing it, killing them, sorry. Uh, and then high phosphorus levels, depending on the soil that you're on, that's probably more of a priority. We know the results from Asa will not dwell on that. So in terms of biodiversity then, like obviously biodiversity has its own value. We all appreciate it. But I suppose, why does it matter for an individual farmer? I have heard before, and I will probably hear again, which are, what good is that? What good is that thing? And what we have to understand is that when an ecosystem unbalances, it will have knock-on effects because we're part of the ecosystem. And a really simple example of this was, you know, the, the wiping out of birds of prey um, and the loss of, of some of the habitat for the likes of buzzards uh, in the 60s, 70s and 80s. And the massive explosion that we've had in hooded crows, and I wouldn't imagine any farmer on this um, on this today is a huge fan of hooded crows because we all know they're they're quite nasty creatures to have around the place. But I suppose a, a local example of that: um, buzzards started breeding on my farm four years ago. Uh, they've successfully fledged three times. The the crow population has absolutely plummeted. Our, we used to be, you know, they they're constantly eating meal on us and devouring crops. Um, but now we really do see because they've been predating on the on the chicks. So I suppose what it really matters, and I suppose this was a this was a shot from my single farm payment this year, uh, and I just wanted to to highlight it as an issue because this was taken. This image was very clearly taken during the drought um, last year. So you can see how burnt up my part of East Cavan got. Now look, we're we're lucky to have dry soil uh, up here, and and it's mostly a, a gravel base, which so dries out fast. But I mean you can just see the impact that that's going to have. And, and increase in climate change means two things. It means flooding and it means more drought. Um, and unfortunately, we're going to have to be the ones suffering from this. When I talk about climate change, it won't be people sitting in an office in Dublin. Uh, no offence to anyone who sits in an office, but it will be the farmers on the ground who will suffer the worst effects of climate change. Uh, and while we will suffer, obviously, so many of the countries that are already more vulnerable, will suffer greater, but nonetheless, we will not escape it. Our fields will be flooded, uh, our lands will be flooded in winter, and we will enter into drought. Not every year, that's not how climate change works, but it will be a, an effect. So quick introduction to the, the terminology I'm gonna be using, just because sometimes it can be, it be useful. I'm not gonna, we've already talked about ammonia gas here, methane, this is belched by cows, one of my favorite things. I always say, if you're reading an article and it says you know anything about cow farts, stop reading it, that person has no idea what they're talking about it's a waste of time so it is it's released it's breathed out nitrous oxide emissions is incredibly powerful the greenhouse gas which is released by the likes of slurry and fertilizer about 276 times the carbon dioxide emissions carbon dioxide itself mostly from fossil fuels is mostly pretty farm gate i know we've all seen the pictures of our, our tractors belching black smoke but in reality most of that is actually 
um, you know, most of the, the carbon dioxide in the food uh, cycle is transportation and production of fertilizers, etc. Um, but there is a very big question around drain peat, for instance, and the release of carbon dioxide. So can carbon sequestration save us? Uh, it's going to be a very vital, important element of what we do, because we aren't measuring it 100 percent at the moment, uh, particularly soil sequestration but it won't be enough to offset what we are doing. We are going to need to take a, a double-sided approach. And that's what we've done here. We've tried to increase carbon sequestration, but in order to balance the book, you need to reduce your emissions one way or another. Um, and, and it's a very complicated global political matter trying to measure these things and the accuracy. And again, Chagas are doing a lot of research. I know, I know on this uh, and like it, we're very hopeful, but that will take time, ultimately time that we just don't have. Uh, and in terms of hedgerows, we need a net increase in hedgerows and like new or bigger hedgerows. And we're talking about changing the management. The existing hedgerows, if they were there in, in 1990, simply won't cut it for from an emissions inventory point of view. So uh, Mark tipped on a little bit on the, um, the, I suppose, battle that there's currently going on. And I wanted to kind of look at this uh, from a farmer's point of view for a second and say, OK, well, I don't want this to be an us versus them. So what I say we i think it's more the farming community and our advisors and, and the entire industry around us and they means i suppose more environmentalists but also the wider public uh, you know what are they looking at so what we say and and these are all factually accurate and true statements ireland has the we say that ireland has the lowest emissions per liter of milk in in the eu and the fourth lowest in beef and the best assessment that we have at the moment says that very clearly that is true um, however, what they say, and they are also right, is that Ireland has the highest percentage of national emissions in the EU uh, related to agriculture, 35 and growing. Um, they say, like we say that Ireland has the second highest water quality in the EU after Austria, I believe, um, which is true. Uh, but Ireland, uh, but farming, as, as they rightfully point out, farming is still the largest pressure on water quality with declines in most categories. Um, and the reality of this, I suppose, is that, you know, we are the largest land use, so it kind of makes sense, uh, but it's still something that we have to deal with. Um, Ireland has above the EU average uh, area of habitat on farms at about 13 percent, and obviously it varies between the, the west and the east of, of the country very often. But you compare that to the likes of only 2.1 percent in the Netherlands. Um, and again, that is true. But it's also true that farmland birds, particularly iconic ones like Carlow and uh, Corn Creek, but also the likes of Yellowhammer and, and Meadow Pippet, are declining and some species by as much as 50 percent over the, the last couple of years partially due to habitat loss and trying to protect those so again those are both those those sides of that discussion are both accurate in what they're saying there is a lot of misinformation going around but those are both accurate in what we're saying so the question is how do we move from what we have in our column to affecting what is in the other column um and again there's this dichotomy uh, and this kind of argument all the time that you have so-called intensive farmers on one side and on the other side you have high nature value farmers well here's some two lovely pictures i mean you've got your green grass on, on the left hand side and uh, you have my dairy cows coming in and you know you have your fertilized grass there okay you've got hedgerows and that and it's growing it's great and on the other side you have this wonderful uh, species rich meadow uh, land well there isn't a dichotomy and it's kind of nonsense because that they're both my farm they're different parts of my farm but they're both my farm and the reality is uh, the one with the cows is the one that's paying for the one uh, with the with the uh, species rich grassland. Because if I want to be a full time farmer, uh, if I want to make money, I need to I need to pay for that. I can't just sit on land. But not all the changes that we make are going to be equal. And I broadly on our farm, when we were implementing these things, uh, we looked at kind of three different things and how quickly we could implement them, changes in practice, whatever costs. So on the on the easy win side, and, and as you see, I've kind of related these back to so AM means ammonia, CC means climate change measure, biodiversity is, is represented by bio, and, and WQ is uh, water quality. So protected urea is a straight swap. Uh, it's very simple. Uh, we did it uh, three or four years ago. I think at this stage we started using it, and we're we've been fully protected urea for three years. Apart from trying to trying to source it sometimes. It's very straight. Low emission slurry spreading it requires, yes, it either requires you to purchase one or if you're using the contractor. My contractor purchased it, so it was a very straight swap for us. We pay a little bit more, but we get far better return from the grass because it's not covered in, in slurry. Liming, I mean, liming is the easiest, cheapest fertilizer that you can use, but we're still uncommon. Improving the beef value of dairy bread stock, 
again, this is selecting a decent high, uh, high DBI, either AI straw or a terminal, high terminal bull when you're, when you're breeding. Improving hedgerow management, again, simply cutting them in the A shape and, and Catherine Keena and others have done great work on this. But again, it's the problem of a lot of contractors are not aware of it. My contractor, no problem. Again, same guy uh, switched. Yeah, I want you to cut it in an A shape, right? What does that mean? Okay, yeah, grand, we can do whatever you want. You're paying the bill ultimately. And if farmers made that simple change, you'd actually have a huge benefit for both biodiversity and for, for climate change. Uh, but the other simpler one is just cutting less often. Um, most hedges don't need to be cut every year. We cut on a three-year cycle um, and they don't escape out in the ditches. We're not losing land. It's just a matter of management. Uh, milk recording or cattle weighing is the obvious, you know, again, it's uh, from a performance point of view, but also from climate change and ammonia point of view, cutting that lower percentage of the herd. Uh, I once heard that, uh, that you could cut 5% of, an, uh, of most dairy herds and it wouldn't affect the bull tag whatsoever. And that is true. Uh, because you've got animals taking feed that are just not performing. Uh, but if you don't know it, you can't manage it. Uh, and increasing longevity and reducing involuntary culling. So again, that ties back to that breeding healthier cows in the first place. Now, the smaller changes in the investments that you uh, need to make are the likes of sex semen. And you need good heat management with that. We've got a uh, vasectomized bull with a chin ball on him and tail paint uh, to run it. Clover Incorporation, I, I know that you know there is rightfully a very big push on this. Uh, but the reality is in, in colder um, soils, it can be more difficult. Upgrading fertilizer spreaders, for instance, and we'll tip on that in a second. Tolerance of weeds is probably the most psychologically the hardest idea. Um, you know, having areas of the farm that are wild and, and resisting the urge to spray or to uh, top them can be very difficult. Trying to incorporate them into fields as well uh, it can be a very big challenge. Red clover silage, we are managing that at the moment. Uh, we have one field where no nitrogen has gone into it for two years now, uh, and it's still able to give us four cuts of silage and, and really high quality stuff. Minimum tillage, again, uh, that's um, really, you know, minimum tillage, I think probably the fastest adoption has been up here in Cavan because we hate picking stones. Um, so the, um, sorry, I'm just doing this. Um, so the bigger costlier investments and the likes of renewable energy, and ultimately they have to pay uh, in order for us to do them. Uh, solar panels, uh, ponds are re-wetting, you're going to be losing land. Uh, covering all slurry tanks are going to be essential for ammonia emissions and recontouring farm uh, roadways. So on fertilizer, I mean, it's probably the single biggest um, change that, that most of us can make. I think there needs to be a bit of a, a, a change in our attitude towards fertilizer um, because fertilizer doesn't grow grass. Uh, if you don't have growing conditions, it's not going to grow grass, uh, no matter how much nitrogen you spread. You need sun, water, soil, and, and ultimately heat. Uh, and in those conditions, then fertilizer helps to grow grass faster. And that's ultimately key to this. But it's the largest source of non-methane emissions for agriculture. Uh, it's the largest source of water pollution. And we've done a great job here on kind of point source pollution. So leaks, for instance, from the um, slurry tanks, et cetera. Um, and roadway runoffs is really, you know, it's it, there's been massive improvements there. But the diffuse one is a bit, sorry, the, the diffuse one is a bit more complicated. So too much slurry too early in ground conditions. And we all know the challenges of calendar farming. And there may be better conditions at the back end, but, you know, tanks have to be emptied. Um, but maybe going a little bit lighter and, and having that kind of risk factor, okay, I'm only going to half empty my tanks, but I'm only going to apply it at 1,500 gallons. It's not always an option, but when it is it is excellent early nitrogen and i think i mean ultimately it does depend where in the country you are uh, and uh, you know your time for nitrogen but ultimately you need soil temperatures and you need it to be dry uh, the same rules apply in in spring as in autumn and in heavy wet soils we see that mostly nitrogen is lost to the air and nitrous oxide emissions so that's a climate change issue in dry sandy soils is mostly lost to the water uh, I think low, low, low use of nutrient management plants can actually be a very big challenge because a lot of farmers have paid for them now, but they're not using them on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and the, my, in my personal opinion, so these are both my personal opinion, and, and feel free to um, feel free to disagree in the in the Q and A's. Uh, I I don't use compounds on our farm. I found them unusable when I was doing the nutrient management plan. It was far more straightforward for me to just use uh, P and K. Why? Because I'd have fields with K index four and uh, P index two. I'd have fields with P index four and K index two. Um, so it was just uh, eighteen six twelve to me. I don't think is a is a very useful compound at all. Uh, and again, I know that's a controversial statement, but we we follow the sustainable uh, use program on the on the nutrient management plan. And then in terms of ignoring calendars, again, I don't get upset if I don't have X amount of nitrogen spread by a certain date. 
uh, my question is have I grown enough grass this spring and and uh, have the weather conditions been uh, you know good enough to, to get the return on that um you like if a calf is not eating uh, and ultimately grass is not that different uh, if it's not growing putting nitrogen onto it is not going to help all it's going to do is lead to pollution events um and that's the little uh, comedic bit so i suppose when the conditions are right what do you need well, well where possible no no fertilizer but this is rarely the case let's be honest about it um clover can perform on its own without it but it depends on your stocking density it depends on a whole number of things particularly at the spring um it can be very hard this time of year where we might skip a whole fertilizer uh, round and i know a lot of dairy farms have started doing that and then you, again that all depends on the soil condition being right so your p and k your lime for your ph and then your nitrogen after that so what we spread is very simple slurry straights um and protected urea um nothing more complicated than that and we follow the nutrient management planner uh so in terms of water quality in terms of the investments that we've made so you can see this is a new um, roadway was put in it was sloped towards the field uh, on the other side of the hedge there for runoff as well we had to break a few um, things to keep it uh, from flowing down uh, so we've contoured it we have speed bumps and all the rest of that sort of activity on it to because again everywhere in Cavan is either on a hill or uh, at the bottom of the hill and by the bottom of the hill there's an awful lot of streams and rivers and lakes so that's really what we focused on we upgraded the fertilizer spreader after the old one uh, i think it was 30 years old eh, itself uh, one day uh, and instead of buying a brand new one what we did was we went for a second hand one with a higher spec so weighted for instance and hydraulic control on both sides and that allowed me a much more accurate spread when i'm going around the field um so you know if i get near a wet spot i'll cut it down or i'll, I'll shut it off altogether and spread on the other side um, this is our red clover. It's just taken there recently. It's beginning to regrow. You can see it. Um, it's also got a little bit of white clover in it. Our nutrient management plan. Uh, and again, this is the challenge to use the nutrient management plan because uh, the nutrient management plan is spot on. Yeah, I've got a rate of say 54% here for urea. Um, but what does that mean? Like, uh, you know, if, I, if I'm talking to my dad or I'm talking to a student, I'm telling him to go out and spread. I can't tell him to go 54. Uh, I can set that on the spreader. But how many kilos of nitrogen or what bag is it going to be? So what we did was we just put it into an Excel file and created it so that it multiplied out. And there may be other systems for doing it. It's just the one that we've been using for the last while. Uh, and as you can see, the cross outs are all, I suppose, where we spread. So you can see we jumped, we skipped quite a lot in spring um, already because the weather conditions simply weren't there for us in, in January to March. And so we went a bit heavier in um, later on in the year. Um, so the warts, uh, I suppose this is where, and look, we haven't had an issue with protected urea. Um, and the evidence is that there isn't an issue of protected urea. The research is all there. Uh, I'd be very confident in using it. I think some of the challenge around moving to protected urea is for farms that weren't using urea beforehand and not giving it enough time when switching from can. Um, the lower six week calving risk is always a risk with, with more sex even because you're more likely to get repeats. You get about 46% conception rate. Uh, we got a little bit higher on some bulls, maybe 70% on some bulls, and then other bulls 20% last year, uh, which is very poor. Uh, this year, I, I, uh, looking at the, the, for, at the fertility at the moment, we have a lot more of held. We haven't gone to the 42 days yet. But it takes a bit of an iron constitution to introduce your beef bull uh, before you're even finished your first round of AI, because the beef bull is going to pay for the extra sex semen. Um, and allowing an animal to repeat that might be a good animal. I mean, this morning, one of my, my favorite animals is after repeating, and it's just going to beef because that's what has to do, happen now. Um, but that being said, I had uh, I had two Frisian bulls or, or Jersey Cross bulls born this year out of 27 calvings. The other 25 are all heifers. So, I mean, that return, I, I'll take that return very happily. And then we had another 10 limousines, which we were selling at over 300 euros a piece. And we were able to sell Anguses before most people were selling Anguses, so make benefit of an early market. Uh, ultimately, there's no returns to the market where these are not cost neutral. Most of the things I've talked about have been cost neutral. The failures and the unknowns is always risky for farmers. Multi-species, there's huge potential, but weed control is quite simply a nightmare. If the if the sward is not already clean, uh, and I'll be telling you about how it kind of failed for us. And then increasing droughts and flooding as a result of climate change are actually going to make a lot of these measures harder. Um, so this is our multi-species. As you can see, it's failed. And it's failed in the worst possible way because you can see the chicory and plantain has established really well, but so have all those spear thistles. Um, and this is a very dirty field. And we're trying to figure out how, because ultimately there are no products available at the moment that are chicory and plantain and clover safe all at once. Uh, we didn't even have a clover safe spray until recently. Back again. Um, so 
the issue really for us is um you know how do we um how do we kind of how do we manage this uh now look this was unfortunate because we put it in at the start of a six week drought and essentially nothing moved uh, for the greatest period of time which is a massive issue for us um do i consider it a total failure no because it didn't work in what we wanted to do but again uh, it's going to be challenging if we if we spread the uptake of these because obviously that's gone beyond spot spraying um so in terms of biodiversity, I think this is the biggest kind of challenge is probably a little bit more in the psyche than it is anything else. Uh, space for nature. So this on the on the hedgerow side, right, that's a cut hedgerow. So that hedgerow is not going to be cut again for another three years, but you can very clearly see the shape. Um, and it's a really good angle of the of the triangular shape, maximizing the amount of height and thickening the base. That hedge will deliver for biodiversity over the next couple of years. It, it'll deliver at the moment for shelter. It won't. It won't uh flower or fruit this year and i i it often kills me to see hedgerows cut on an annual basis because ultimately they're delivering nothing for biodiversity at all um so this is something that we could do and actually literally saves us money here um but cutting it in the a shape is essential as well for the biodiversity uh ragwort absolute hateful plant i hate it around the place but at the same time uh, those are cinnabar moth um uh, caterpillars uh, and so the resistance is always to try and uh, prevent because more of those ultimately will eat down and I've seen them devour an entire ragwort spray but unfortunately their their numbers have declined over the years and a wee patch of nettles uh, and as people can see in that that's actually full of caterpillar silk um, so this was this tiny patch just a little patch in one of my grazing fields and when I went around it I copped it from while I was topping and I went Do you know what I'm going to leave it there but I have no doubt that people thought it was absolutely crazy because we're sitting in the middle of a field, this tiny patch of nettles. Why would he not tidy it up when the rest of the field was clean? But I mean, you can literally see there are thousands there. Um, so a very small, inter literally nothing. I'd have to do nothing in order to protect that. So then in terms of greenhouse gas emissions and how we can we can try to meet those. Um, and again, I, I said I kind of specialised on this. So methane is the largest and, and most significant greenhouse gas that, that we in our agricultural system have to deal with. And ironically, it's actually the opposite when we're talking about beef or dairy. So in, in dairy cows, I mean, longer life uh, means lower lifetime emissions because that animal for two years is, is producing um, while it's growing. So the less heifers that you ultimately have coming in and, and the faster those animals calve, uh, if you like the overheads, to use a financial term, uh, carryover of, of methane are diluted over the animal's lifespan. Uh, so we know that, say, increasing and the target for a lot of farms is 5.5 lactations. I mean, that's ultimately key to profitability. It, it's reducing because the animal is not paying itself back in its first lactation. It's not, it, it occasionally will pay itself back in the second lactation. It's a very high performing animal. Um, but in reality, you're talking about third third lactation before it's it's really and ultimately pre lactation doesn't often come until after fourth lactation. Um, so again, how do we do this? Though we need to improve EBI, we need to get good genetics into the herd. So we need to be selecting, and that means more voluntary culling and less involuntary culling. So less animals lame, less animals uh, with mastitis, less animals with infertility problems. Uh, and then selecting out those animals to breed more efficiently. And this is where sex semen comes in, because I won't breed my whole herd. I'll only breed the top percentage of my herd, because I know even with the 46% conception rate that I will be. So I'll use my beef earlier on. Uh, lower replacement rates, again, once you're not expanding, if your herd is stable. More mature cows in the third and fifth lactation. And calving, of course, between 20 and 26 months. For dairy, though, it's the opposite way around. In reality, I'm talking here about dairy beef, because I don't want to comment on, on suckling. It's not my, it's not my industry. Um, but I mean, the, the key elements here are age at slaughter, getting that lower while maximizing the carcass weight. No point killing a 22 month uh, steer that, you know, is killing into 180 kilos carcass weight because that isn't great for the climate either. But the key is how to get up on that and then balance that and get them finished off grass as much as physically possible. And it is very doable. Uh, it's an it's an ultimate pity to me that the way that we deal with bull beef in this country, because I think bull beef certainly is a manufacturing product, maybe not so much for steak. Uh, is easily the lowest carbon emissions, easily, uh, per kg of beef. Uh, and the sire is ultimately more vital than the dam, in my opinion. So again, moving away from producing um, these sort of uh, dairy bread stock and trying to reduce the number of heifers, and that's where sex semen comes in again, um, but ultimately as well, selecting these, these bulls. So what you see on one side uh, is the lactation summary for one of my cows. You can see she's currently in 11th lactation um, and still performing very well, has, has 
uh, been bolt and i think she's on 21 days now at this stage um you can see her kind of again protein percentages but what's a really interesting one you see her in her seventh lactation she delivered her peak at 707 uh, and that was only in 293 and again these are milk recorded data um this was a crossbred cow uh, actually a Montbelliard for Asian cow um but you can see the performance and even in the fifth lactation there you got 605 kgs of milk solids uh delivered so a lot of farmers I talk about, you know, they talk about culling out on age. Uh, I personally don't. If an animal is healthy and an animal is able to go back and calf, why not keep her? And she will deliver for you. Again, the, the bull below is an Angus. Uh, it's my own stock bull. Um, uh, I had to spend a little bit of money buying him, but uh, I won't say how much. Um, but uh, high terminal index, 86 of an EBI, which within his own breed is, is five star. Uh, it's still only three star crossbreed, of course. But I, I, like, I'm looking for a short gestation, easy calf and bull. His calves are delivering. The interesting thing is because I sell all X farm, I'm getting repeat customers coming back to me and going, do you have any more of that? Uh, and they know that the Anguses I sell them are number one, actually Anguses. And number two, I'll tell them if there's Jersey blood in them, I'll tell them if there's whatever blood in them. But they've like generally reported to me that ultimately it's the bull that matters far more uh, for when they're uh, killing out. Um, so there's a sec. So that was, I suppose, a whistle stop tour. I kind of want to give a lot of time um, for questions because uh, I know there might be uh, challenges to some of what I've said here, and I, I welcome those too. Um, as someone, as Mark said, I think at the beginning, I was very outspoken during my tenure. Um, and uh, if people want to contact me by email or by uh, uh, Twitter, they're, they're perfectly free to do so. I suppose the element that unfortunately I don't have very nice pictures on, as I said, is, is the biodiversity on the farm. Um, you know, this is one of our lone bush and stuff. I've kind of touched on a little bit. Um, one of the good indicators for our farm is the fact that that buzzard is continuing to breed on our farm because it indicates that there's sufficient feed. Uh, and that means that the, the entire ecosystem underneath it is. Uh, and thankfully, we don't have any poultry farms too close uh, that he might cause issues for. Uh, so, look, I think that is it. And I think ultimately as well, I had a very interesting, and I just finished on this anecdote, I had a very interesting uh, presentation one day to um, my father who was involved with the men's shed. And uh, most of the men in that were in their uh, late 60s, 70s, 80s. Um, and we had a discussion about biodiversity and they were talking about how they listened to the curlew growing up. And I had to stop them for a second and say, I have never heard a curlew or a corn craig except in recording because that has been lost by the time that I started my farming career. Um, and this is something we talk about shifting baseline that we might not always. And the past was not a perfect thing. I, I often tell people that. I mean, kill crow and all those were, aren't being used by my generation. Um, but ultimately, uh, it is a challenge for us to see the changes that are happening because they often happen at a very slow scale. Unfortunately, a lot of them are speeding up and climate change is one of those things. Uh, but I suppose the only like if I can if I can finalize on a message, I would say that in everything, um, reducing our our impact to the environment is saving us money. And that's ultimately what's what's the key for farmers. And that's the key message that I I focus on in my presentations. But thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Mark, again, for for giving me the opportunity to speak and uh, we'll leave it open to questions. Or that. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, Thought provoking, as always. Uh, so. For all of those people who wondered who the face behind Tay saves lives, <laughs> finally get to, to, to meet him. Uh, so and you're obviously active on very active on Twitter. So you you're you're very aware of the 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 I suppose the differing views that are out there around agriculture. And uh, I suppose my question to you is how confident are you that uh, we will meet uh, the various environmental targets that are set out, uh, particularly, I know you spoke about ammonia a lot during your presentation. Um, yeah, that, 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 that's a general question, I know, yeah. but uh, what's, what's, your, what's your view on that? Right, so my, my view um, is the, before we start kind of talking about how much we can get farmers to do, we have to eliminate all the barriers. So again, ammonia is a great example um, because, right, um, at the moment, we know there's obviously delays with manufacturing. So many farmers are buying low emission slurry spreading um, that the, the actual manufacturers can barely keep up. And a really interesting anecdote, so I, I started using low emission slurry spreading here. And most of my neighbours are actually we're in a slightly strange area of the, the world because most of my neighbours are full-time beef farmers. They're not part-time, they're full-time beef farmers. Uh, and they would have been a bit sceptical of all of this. And then all of a sudden, I remember I drove over one day and every every neighbor had adopted low emission slurry spreading because they had seen it work on our farm. 
you can you can only do what you see. Um, but for the likes of Protected Urea, for instance, it, it, like it was a massive challenge for us the last three years to actually get access to this. And, and I know during my time in Mocker, we did a survey and 50% of farmers were not able to get Protected Urea. If it's not there, we can't buy it. And ultimately, this is where the industry has to deliver for us. If it's there, uh, farmers will take up these measures. We look at sex semen. I mean, we've been we've been bashing the sex semen because we've been behind the UK on it for years. This year, we've seen a massive increase in sex semen. Um, which will have a lot of knock-on benefits, but not actually maybe for the guy who's using the sex semen, maybe for the next guy who's finishing the animals uh, and, and less of those having to be exported. So am I confident that farmers could? Yeah, I am very confident that farmers could. I think you will always have the early adopters than the mass adopters. I think with most of these technologies we're now at mass adoption point, you will have holdouts, you will have resistance, you will have people going back or whatever. Um, but again, the likes of, say, Clover is a simple example. The fact that there was such little joint up thinking um, that we lost Clover Max and we lost 2,4-DB and there was no outcry. I think this was very disappointing, actually, from an environmentalist point of view. There was no outcry about the farmers losing this. Now, thankfully, obviously, Chagas and the Department of Agriculture have worked to get, uh, get us access to that again. But the fact that there was that detachment while we were simultaneously meant to be reducing our nitrogen fertilizer that we couldn't seed Clover in was, was crazy. We had um, two speakers last week from Birdwatch Ireland, Amita Donaghy and Luna Duggan, who were speaking about the decline in bird numbers. Um, and I think look, they were quite critical of the, we call it the system. They weren't, look, they weren't, I don't think they were leveling it at individual farmers by any means, but just, I just felt that the system of farming in this country was leading us down a path of uh, declining bird numbers and biodiversity. Um, you know, how... How can we reverse that? Um, is is there are there enough uh, signals coming from the marketplace, from policy, to to support farmers in achieving this? I think well, ten percent of, of farm uh, farms to to be covered uh, to to be allocated to biodiversity. I think is is one of the targets they would they would claim that that's probably a little un, under ambitious. What's your thoughts on that? So uh, first on uh, on returns to the market, there's nothing. There's nothing, there's no benefit. Uh, I mean, the consumer is great about saying they want these things, but they're not paying for it. And that's the long and the short of it. Uh, the likes of the Board B Origin Green Programme is the, probably the closest that we get to it. And it's been criticised by a lot of people, I think, unfairly. Um, what I will say in terms of, again, what the focus should be on is every farm has an area of unproductiveness and that's patches and stuff like that. It, the question isn't it, for me so much about the area of habitat question is about the quality of habitat uh, you can do a lot with five percent that if you have ten percent twenty percent thirty percent of your farm semi-abandoned it's gonna it's gonna yield nothing i've got areas of my farm that are not managed as a habitat and they're not yielding uh, really but they are less intensively farmed so this is this is a challenge for us um, in terms of reversing it there are some things that we can simple things that we can do and then there are more complicated more challenging things the biggest thing would probably be money for direct interventions uh, for the likes of our are really critically. And I know farmers, very highly stocked dairy farms that are currently protecting curlew and corn crake on their farms or curlew anyway, um, and others that are, are managing. As I said, I, I showed the high nature value farming that we have on our farm as well. We haven't got any of these rare, that the, I think the rarest we have is the snipe that seems to, for some reason, love grazing on our intensive grassland and not a, a kind of abundance in nearly overgrown areas. Um, and what would concern me as well is the rise of concepts like rewilding, and la which is essentially just land abandonment, uh, because that, that's going to be a pinch point between these species. These species need farm management um, and paying for that. But there is a huge potential here, the farmers. But again, I, I think that uh, the, the rule I always follow is do learn, do better. So, yes, we used a lot of nitrogen to grow grass in the past. Now we're going to use clover to grow more uh, for more grow, grow, grow more grass and use less uh, nitrogen. Uh, protect it like red clover, another example. There are a lot of things that we're doing better today, but it is a slow uptake. And this is ultimately the problem because a lot of these species need this to be accelerated to protect them. I have one final question. I'm going to be selfish here before we get to the, the audience questions. You talked about nutrient management planning and um, the relatively low engagement uh, by farmers with their nutrient. A lot of farmers would have nutrient management plans, but maybe that level of engagement isn't as what we'd like it to be. What, what would be uh, what would be the three or four things you'd like to 
to see happen to or that you think could could uh, help that situation? Yeah. So as I say, I have, a, I have a controversial position on compounds. I don't like compounds because uh, I think they're too complicated. I think it's much simpler for a farmer at, at once or twice a year to go around his entire farm with P and then go around it with K at, at the appropriate time. Uh, and then for silage ground, obviously spread it uh, silage ground. I look, that means more driving and it means a bit more fossil fuels. But ultimately, I think it's much more effective than trying to balance 18, 6, 12 or 10, 10, 20 or whatever with the nitrogen demands. Um, I, the, the the biggest thing, I think, is literally just to use it. And that's why we did it. We stuck it into the Excel file. I, I, I understand that there's the pasture based program are, are doing stuff with this as well. Um, but ultimately that, it you know, it's not something that's shoved down the back of a, of a folder I, like in a previous life, I would have done a few nutrient management plans for farmers and they, their response then was, well, I'm still going to do the same thing I did before. And I'm like, well, there's money to be saved here, and particularly like in areas like Cavan, we, we, we would have benefited from a lot of pig slurry over the years, even very extensive farms would have used uh, exported pig slurry and K index fours. And then I have farmers telling me I'm going to go buy 18612. And I'm like, why are you buying the 12? You have more than enough in your in your K. So save yourself the money there. Um, spread less of something else, but change is difficult. Change is very hard um, to try and manage it. Uh, but it it's it your awareness of the, of the benefits. Yeah. yeah, like awareness of the benefits and and straightforward. Even even liming is is the simplest one because it's a it's a not an annual really process for a lot of farms, but it's it's a once off. Um, and again, just matching with what you have. Great, Thomas. Uh, thanks very much, Pat. Lots of uh, a lot of questions coming in here now. I think. I think a general appreciation of, of your, your, the insights you're given from an awful lot of people who are, who are online this morning. Uh, a question here, not simple, but uh, topical, I suppose, given the day that's in it with, with protests going on around the country. I was wondering uh, if you have any comments or suggestions re regarding the upcoming cap and changes that, that might happen there. So there's been a few uh, elements that have been muted, the likes of um, allowing for landscape features uh, as opposed to, uh, or, you know, not docking for those. Um, I think that's uh, certainly, it, that's a welcome change because it, it opens the door to things. And some of the biggest interventions are the likes of ponds, right? And there's uh, like, there's always a joke on Twitter that all the dairy farms are trying to compete with each other every week. And the other week it was who can build the biggest pond and, and even we're planning a pond here and stuff like that. Uh, mostly because they're just, single biggest change that we can make um so that that's a huge open a kind of a welcoming i think there's potential in the eco schemes uh, and i know our, our uh, again during my time in mocker we would have looked at this um i think there's potential in the eco schemes as long as they're not exclusionary because ultimately if you come to my farm and tell me that i have to uh, become an unviable farm uh, but i have to do this stuff for the environment that's just not going to work for me i'm, I'm going to reject it because i need to make an income i need to make an income for myself and my parents uh, so there has to be a bit more awareness that there's a balanced approach. That's the reason sustainability has four, uh, four uh, pillars. Uh, it's because you can't do anything in isolation with that. But again, maximizing the area which is not very productive uh, would be far more beneficial on each and every farm uh, and ultimately rewarding those farms then that have a higher level of environmental ambition uh, in a progressive way would really change the dial a lot, I think. A question to change tack a bit. Uh, you mentioned that nitrogen doesn't grow grass when conditions aren't suitable. How do you decide when to apply your nitrogen? Yeah, it's a challenging one. Uh, so again, uh, soil, soil temperature is the first and most important one. And then soil saturation level. If I'm walking on a field and it's squinching underneath me, I'm not going to spread nitrogen on that field. And those are, those are just some simple indicators. You can't predict the weather, though. Ultimately, I could spread nitrogen today and it looks like a good weather forecast and then it turns cold and wet. And it happened a couple of times during this year. But even if we can start from that essential point, when soil temperatures are getting up higher, um, instead of spreading before soil temperatures, I'd say, you know, hold the wish a little bit and, and um, wait a little bit longer uh, now and again. And again, it's not necessarily an all or nothing. I have fields here on the top of uh, drumlands, which are much drier um than other fields and i have wetter colder fields uh, and so again it's going back to the nutrient management plan or looking at your your farm not as a an individual but as a whole and then i'd also say in terms of when you are wanting to spread it not not front loading it in a single application so not being afraid to go out with a, a third of a bag of urea equivalent or, or 20 right again compacting you don't want to be doing it too often uh, but certainly I would always tentative steps, let that grass grow, graze it off and then spread my fertilizer 
uh, again the second time at a higher rate. Uh, a fairly blunt question. Uh, has the country reached saturation point in production levels of, of in mil, uh, meat and milk? Uh, if you were to, uh, right, if I was to answer that question bluntly, we probably reached it in the 1920s because we, we export, we're an export nation. Uh, we don't produce solely for ourselves. And I'm very proud of that fact. I mean, my milk goes all over the world and I, I make no apologies for that fact. Um, I'm part of a global community and more importantly, probably more relevantly, I'm part of an EU community. Uh, we we are a very efficient producer here. That doesn't that doesn't exempt us from having to get better, but we are a very efficient producer here. It's far better to produce milk off grass in County Calvin necessarily than it is off grain in Germany. Uh, and maybe some of the German, uh, if there's anyone from Germany, they might disagree with me on that. But that's a fact. We have a low emissions uh, intensity. Again, that doesn't change the fact, though, that we have to get better and we have to protect our own environment for our long term sustainability and their ability to do that. Uh, but in terms of saturation, I mean, how how long we're 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 currently at about seven. And I, I don't I like getting into the we feed the world type discussion. But in terms of this, we know two facts: our populations are growing globally, and the demand for meat and dairy are growing uh, globally. So, is it better for us to improve our structures and try to supply that product from here, or leave it to other countries to do it? And the likes of Brazil and the Mercosurs, which are you know deforesting huge amounts of the Amazon. Uh, again, this is not a we feed the world kind of a thing, but it's just a fact, you know, it, uh, meat can only be consumed once. If it's going to be consumed from Ireland or it's going to be consumed from Brazil, I'd rather it be consumed from Ireland. Well, could, I just te- could I just tease that one out a little bit just around the, you know, the, the tipping point or who decides or where do we or when do we decide, OK, we're we're at a point where we have um, the, that the environment can't sustain any, any more cows or uh, any more um, production or expansion? Because this, this is a question that has, has been raised over and over throughout this entire series. And I know it's, it's, it's look, some would say, look, it's a, a very simplistic uh, view, uh, but uh, I'd just be interested to, to get your views on, you know, yeah. where, where, where does the line stop? The, so the line should be wherever it is minus waste. Um, and so that's ultimately at the moment we are wasting a lot of the resources that we're using. We're losing them to water. We're losing them to air. So we're using more resources than we need to produce to feed. Right. If we could get that back in line. And then again, it's for biodiversity. Again, we are managing things in a way which we don't need to from a productive point of view. But we have a you know, we have a vision in our head of the way things should be. We need to detach ourselves from that. Um, the tipping point is always, I mean, like, uh, I, I, again, we won't drill it into it too much, but I mean, you go back to Malthus and overpopulation and Eldridge, apparently we'd all, we should all be starving. I never should have been born, according to Malthus and those, mm. um, because ultimately, and then we had the likes of the Green Revolution, which brought, um, uh, you know, Norman Borlaug as a personal hero of mine, partially for his attitude towards farming and the changes that, that have prompted and listening to farmers. Uh, that you know the man that saved a billion lives ultimately but with the green revolution came pollution came all the rest of us so we need a new green revolution we need a more sustainable uh, and i don't i don't dwell too much on that term sustainable but like we need a more low impact changes so changes like moving away from ammonia uh, uh, based fertilizers and moving towards clovers and all of these kind of things can reduce it. Ultimately, we are a species that has never failed to live up to a challenge. We've lived through one cataclysmic climate change before in the Ice Age, and we only had sticks and, and woods and, and we were hunting mammoths at the time. Now we have technology and advancements that we can make and implement. The challenge is uptake and how much money is going to be willing to put into it because farmers can't afford to do this all on their own. They need government support. They need support from the community to do that, not demonization. And if you do it and you do it right, you get far more benefit from, from that, I think. Thanks, Thomas. Uh, just a, a, a little bit of confusion in, in, in among some of the audience uh, between multi-species sward and species rich sward, which you ah, yes. featured both of. And, and maybe you might describe, I suppose, the role and the, and the potential uh, yeah. advantages of both in terms of environmental yeah. outcomes. Sorry, yeah, and uh, I probably mixed up the terminology. I probably should have used high nature value farming there in terms of that. Uh, so the multi, uh, the species rich or, or high nature value farming are naturally occurring meadows. Uh, so there you have slight own productive type uh, products. So yeah, you'll still get plantain in both of them. You might get chicory in both of them, but there you'll find, excuse me, the daisies, the yellow rattles, 
um, the wild clovers and all of those are growing. And really uh, the way we manage that is a very low intensity area, uh, maximizing it for species richness and for biodiversity. Then the multi-species grassland is a, an attempt essentially partially to, to cut out uh, as much fertilizer as possible, but also to make it more resilient to drought. So there you're talking about your perennial ryegrass, uh, you're talking about your red and white clovers, you're talking about your uh, chicory and plantain, and there are additional ones that other farms also put in. I think there's a seven seed mix, we use five seed mix. Ultimately, those are still, they're still intensive management. I mean, I'm still grazing them intensively. It's a different form of intensive management. Um, and there is benefits for biodiversity in terms of the white clover will still flower and stuff, but really there for a nutrient management uh, and a climate change measure less than they are a biodiversity measure. The biodiversity measure is your species rich grasslands, your high nature value farming areas. Um, yeah. A question, an interesting question, and it's, it's, it's uh, following on from the topic that, that Tom Arnold discussed, uh, where uh, the question here is saying there's a big division emerging between farmers, especially dairy farmers and environmentalists. How can we find, or what do we need to do to find middle ground, or is there middle ground? There is middle ground between some of both. Um, I often hear saying like there's always middle ground between all of us. I don't think there is middle ground between all of us. I think it depends ultimately. Um, and one of the interesting things that, uh, that I, when I studied environmental science is there is two competing philosophies. One is a uh, wise use philosophy, which basically says, look, human beings exist. Human beings need to be fed. Um, and how can we do that in the best possible way and leave as much space for nature as possible? Then there's the competing philosophy that human beings shouldn't be the center of the world. And uh, ultimately, that goes down a very dark path, in my opinion. And needless to say, I very much subscribe to the wise use philosophy on this. But in the wise use philosophy uh, and farmers, there is a big overlap uh, because farmers ultimately do care uh, to some extent about the environment. And often it's simply, I mean, uh, the simplest example I often give. On, on farms around the country, if you dig up the soil, you will find plastic, right? Uh, farmers in the past buried plastic. Why? Because a lot of older farmers didn't realize it would last forever. They just didn't. Uh, everything else broke down. So when plastic was introduced, it was an issue. There's no excuse for burying plastic today. Um, I mean, you recycle it. That's what you do. You don't burn it, you recycle it. Um, and ultimately, like there, there is a place. But yet, when I went over recently to a plastic recycling center, I mean, you hear about these wonderful recycling bins. Jesus, there was a there was building height uh, of black plastic where farmers had taken their own time and their own money to recycle a product. So that doesn't tell you something. I don't know what does um, about how care farmers care about the environment. Equally, there are a group of farmers that simply do not care. Um, they are a minority, thankfully, but they do not care. Uh, and there won't be any um, kind of overlap there because we are a diverse community and some people will have different priorities to others. And also it will depend on what your situation is. It's a different matter if I'm not, uh, and, and, and Mark, you mentioned about leaving area for, for things. We're quite landlocked here uh, and we're quite uh, fragmented. I couldn't afford to give a huge amount of area to nature on my grazing platform because I don't have it to give. But my outblocks, different matter, different discussion. I'll still use a bit of the waste ground on my own farm, but yeah, look, that covers a bit of it. Question here in relation to whether you see an opportunity on your farm in relation to uh, energy production. Yes, I do. Uh, so I'm probably one of the few um, full time farmers that you'll come across that drives an electric car. Uh, and there was a deliberate reason why I put my charger up on the, the outside of the dairy, which looks really strange. I get some strange looks and the contractors arrive and there's this car plugged in. Um, because I, I plan to put solar panels on the entire roof of the dairy. But the problem is at the moment, and even in the consultation that was recently done, uh, there's not enough incentive at the moment for small scale um, renewables. And it's a massive issue. We need to reform the whole planning permission area. We need to start feeding it in. We saw even recently, I mean, there's warnings now of, um, of rolling blackouts because the, the grid isn't able to adapt it because we haven't adopted solar fast enough really. And at the moment, the wind is simply not blowing. So we're, again, we're relying on natural gas. But there are sheds throughout the entire country that could be supplying this renewable. It's more of a challenge. I'm not diminishing that from an air grid's point of view. It's much more challenging when you have a lot of smaller suppliers. Uh, but it's definitely something we could do. So the plan here is to invest um, probably a little bit down the line in a solar panel uh, and install. Uh, either we will have a robot, which we won't need to install a battery pack, uh, and we'll be charging the car off that. Um, or we will just be um, charging the car directly and using it for the robot because the robot will use it all the time. 
a question here in relation to uh, buffer zones along your rivers and what are you doing in that respect? Yeah, uh, so the, the, a mainstream runs through the grazing or to the grazing platform and then the rest of them are kind of bounded by it. Uh, so again, we just follow the, the because most of the ground, thankfully, beside it is fairly level. Um, it's not a severe slope. We do take account of the slopes when we're uh, near the streams, when we're spreading fertilizer. Um, so the big advantage, and I mentioned there about the fact that we went for a secondhand machine, when I'm doing the last strip, um, I even a little bit beyond the outside, what I'll do is I'll adjust down my spreader on that side. So I might drop it to 50% beyond the buffer zone. So there's not an extra area. And it depends, really, it depends. Like this time of year, um, I'm not as worried about it, but say when I'm spreading in spring, I'll keep double distance up from it. Okay. Okay, Mark. Mark, you're muted. Well, I have to wrap up the questions there. Thanks, Pat. Um, Thomas, thank you so much for your, your candid views uh, and wise words. Really uh, appreciate uh, you giving us an insight into your, your farm and uh, what's happening there. And uh, hopefully uh, at some stage in that too distant future, we might uh, get to come up and, and visit you at some stage because it's, um, you, you have a great story to tell. Uh, Pat, thanks very much for helping with questions. We're a little bit over time this morning, uh, but uh, I think it was worth uh, holding on for for, for those uh, those insights from Thomas. So thanks again, Thomas. Uh, next week on uh, the uh, Signpost series, we'll be joined by Una Fitzpatrick from Biodiversity Ireland, who's going to be talking about the pollinator plan in Ireland. Uh, so we look forward to, to speaking to Una about that. And I want to say thank you to our production team, Andy Boland and Yvonne Maher and Pat Murphy, of course, and all our partners uh, on, on the series. And uh, we hope you enjoy the fine weather at the weekend and uh, we'll see you next Friday morning. So with that, we'll uh, say goodbye and uh, stay safe. Goodbye.